Well, good morning and welcome back to Whitefield Baptist Church. Uh, I'll be teaching a Sunday school lesson this morning for February the 7th. Uh, Pastor Mike filled in for me last week as I was in the hospital recovering from uh, my surgery uh, where I had my shoulder replaced. I have begun therapy on it now and hopefully I'll be able to use it well soon. But thank you so much for your prayers during this time. This lesson is for February the 7th, in Intimacy with Jesus. It's a great lesson. Uh, it's taken from John chapter 17. So uh, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 17, or you can uh, join me if you have a Sunday school book at home, you can join me in the, in the Sunday school book. I did want to mention one thing. If you look right behind me, uh, there's a banner on my shelf back there. And it is a, it was laying on my desk when I come in or in my office chair when I came in. And it's from Emory and it's to Pastor Bob. And it's a big hug that Emory has drawn for me. He's drawn a big hug. Uh, he has outstretched arms. And it's a hug from Emory. So I don't know if you can see that in the background there, but uh, I like to uh, I like to receive friend things from my friends, and because I love them and uh, and uh, I just want to, them to grow up in the love of Christ. So thank you, Emory, for the big hug that you left me in my office, and uh, I hope that if uh, you'll get to to see that I I. I put that on the video today so that you could be able to see that. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin our lesson, and uh, then we'll seek God's uh, guidance through His Word here as, as we teach the lesson this morning. Lord, I do pray this morning, Father, that you would, uh, Father, just help us, Father, to, as we gather together, Father, that we would want that intimacy with you. Jesus, that that intimacy that you had with your disciples and that intimacy that you want with us i just pray that we would seek that out and lord that we would do the things necessary in our lives to have the intimacy that you want to have that relationship that you want uh father not just a casual uh fly by night relationship not just a in case of emergency relationship but a relationship that is continuous and it is ever growing lord i thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. I thank you for this blessing of having uh, uh, online Sunday school, Father, that we can reach out to those who are, cannot yet come back to church. Father, an opportunity it gives me, Father, to study your word even more, uh, to learn even more about you, uh, that I may be able to try and uh, teach your word to these who are listening. Lord, I pray that your name will be glorified today. I pray that you would move me out of the way Lord, let your Holy Spirit speak through me and that your name be glorified in all that we say and do. And I'll give you praise and glory, Lord, for all that you do. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. You know, a lot of uh, times today in our world, uh, it's, uh, it's gotten to the point that there's not a lot of uh, personal relationship as far as one-on-one, -on -one, face to face uh, type of relationship. Uh, and that's unfortunate in some ways. Uh, it's too easy to text now. It's too easy to to uh, send a Facebook message. It's too easy to do all these Instagrams and Snapchat and all these other things that go around. Uh, it's too easy to send a, a emoji. Uh, we can even make emojis now that look like, uh, resemble us in some ways. But uh, it's that's not the kind of uh, relationship that is a fulfilling relationship. Not the kind of relationship that will... Uh, cause you to grow uh, more uh, in love with that person. You appreciate the, the text, you appreciate the messages, but the, the messages that you get that that one-on-one uh, -on -one and to hug and to, to just uh, have that intimate relationship uh, where you, you love on that person and that person loves on you is the kind of relationship that, that we miss with uh, with all these social media uh, relationships that we have. Although social media is great and, and uh, it can be good, it can be bad, but it can be good. Uh, I'm able to keep up with different people that I may not uh, be in contact with if it wasn't for social media. But it's not the kind of relationship that Christ was talking about when he said that the church should have with him and that we should have with one another. Uh, John 17 is a part of the passages some call, sometimes called the farewell discourses. Uh, John 
records uh, more about Jesus as being God than any of the other Gospels. So um, Mark uh, wrote these, uh, I mean, Mark, John wrote these uh, gospel, this Gospel, the Farewell Discourse, and you find that listed in chapters 13 through 17 of the, the Gospel of John. The verses that we're going to study today are a part of that discourse, and it's part of Jesus' great high priestly prayer uh, in which Jesus interceded on our behalf, on behalf of all believers. Jesus said he would intercede for us, and even us, as uh, just for us as we know each other today, God, Jesus was talking about us. He talked about his disciples, and he talked about his relationship with the Father, and his relationship with the disciples there that day, and the discipleship disciples that he would have in the future, those who would believe on him and go and fulfill the great commission that he left us. Jesus prayed for you and me. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that he, he ever liveth to make intercession for those who believe. You see, Jesus lives to make intercession for us. He sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession on our behalf. So this prayer was was uh, spoken by Jesus to the Father. He, he prayed out loud to his Father, and he prayed that, that out loud so the disciples would be able to hear the substance of this prayer. Uh, his prayer uh, was for God to be glorified. His prayer was for unity among for believers, and his prayer was for them to know the fullness of his love. And that prayer that he prayed that, time, that night, uh, but just before his crucifixion, uh, was the prayer that he prayed for you and I. And it's still, today, it's still real, and it still uh, uh, applies to you, to you and I as Christians. So let's read these first five verses of John 17. It said, Then these words, these words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal this is life eternal, that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus went on to say, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And Jesus said, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before for the world was with this prayer jesus aligned his heart with that of the fathers he prayed these words it says jesus spoke these words jesus spake spoke these things and he lifted up his eyes to the father and he prayed and and he was he was praying this prayer and and his prayer and his desire was that that the disciples would also align their hearts with god and that you and i would align our hearts with god uh, that in, in the, it, this prayer that's it, recorded here is the, the longest prayer in, in the uh, Gospels that's recorded by Jesus himself to the Father. So this was an important prayer. It was a prayer of Jesus in his last few days or last hours of preparing for his crucifixion. And he said, in these words Jesus spake, and said he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, uh, Jesus recalled his mission to the Father in these verses. Um, he prayed for himself in verses 1 through 5. He prayed for his disciples in verses 6 through 19. And he prayed for all believers in verses 20 through 26. Um, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He addressed God as his Father. You know, my father's passed away. My father's been dead for several years now. But how many times I've thought I would like to just... Uh, call him daddy one more time and see him face to face you know I, I know where he's at and and i'm i'm blessed and i wouldn't want him back here for anything in the world uh and i know one day i'll see him but here jesus called to his heavenly father to his father and and he looked up and he honored him by calling him father uh god was known as the lord yahweh in in most in most instances where you see him called upon uh the lord was almighty but the name father was rarely used uh, jesus used it uh was saying something significant here when he spoke to the father he was saying something that he wanted the disciples there to hear he was saying something that he wanted us to hear 
and he acknowledged that that the hour is come uh, now the hour that's come is not the the uh, the hour not the time of day or a a particular time on the clock the hour had been mentioned several times uh, uh, before by Christ but he would always say the hour has not yet come and he was talking about this time that he would be crucified the hour that he would suffer the hour that he would be nailed to the cross the hour that he would be beaten and spat upon the hour that he would be denied by his own disciples the hour that he would say it is finished and give his all for us that we could have salvation the hour that the temple curtain would be torn where we would all have access to the father this is the hour that he was talking about now the hour has come before he would say the hour has not yet come but now he says that the hour has come uh, it, it was the conclusion of his earthly ministry as as we know it so jesus said the hour is come the time grew near for him to complete his mission here on earth the time had grew near for for him to complete what god the father had sent him to earth to do and he he had preached the gospel he had made disciples and he lived a perfectly sinless life and this would would now come on culminate in his atoning sacrifice on the cross the hour has now come his sacrifice on the cross would make redemption possible Jesus stated that the ultimate purpose of his mission was Jesus stated the ultimate purpose of mission with his request to glorify thy son that thy son may glorify you now we may find it odd to, to hear Jesus say glorify thy son it may sound like he was asking for something for himself but he was not uh, to glorify is to render excellence to and render praise to render honor to magnify to celebrate and and jesus was wanting god to glorify him that he may in turn glorify the father you know that should be our desire in our life that that everything we say and do that jesus would be pleased in us that he would glorify us that we may in turn glorify him that his name would be glorified it, it was the ultimate sacrifice. It wasn't a, a selfish request, but it was his request and a, a sacrificial request that God go ahead and let's, I, I'm ready to be sacrificed. I'm ready to go to the cross to glorify you and that you would glorify me that I could glorify you. It, it wasn't selfish. It was so that God could be glorified. Uh, the Father's glorification of him through that glorification of Jesus Christ, then the Father himself would be glorified. When God the Father glorified Jesus, Jesus would there glorify the Father. Because God, Jesus had come and done what God had called him to do. There were many trials and temptations and things that Jesus went through, but he, was, he, he had put aside his, his powers that he had as God to, to show that as a man... He was able to live a sinless life. Uh, as I was, I was studying in my my Monday morning Bible study with Miss Mikey Cole the other morning, she she we were reading about when Jesus was tempted, you know, and when he was baptized, he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. But then he was says that when he had rejected Satan those three times, he was led out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's through these trials and through the things that we go through, and it may be the death of a loved one. It may be a sickness. It may be some particular hardship that we have that grows us stronger, makes us even more thankful to be his child. Because, see, when we go through those things, even death, even the loss of a loved one, if that loved one knows Jesus Christ your Savior, we have the promise of, in, of a hope that we will see them again there in heaven. So Jesus prayed that God the Father would glorify himself through Jesus' sacrificial death, which he referred to here as the hour. This, this hour has come. Jesus went on in verse 2 to state that, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that thou should, he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given to him. God had, had given 
him power over all flesh. You see, Jesus' mission was global. It extended to all people. It wasn't just the people there in Israel. It just wasn't the Jews. It, it wasn't just the Gentiles, but it was all, all people. God the Father gave the Son. You see, the sovereign God had the power to, to give to whoever he wants the power to do anything. And he gave the Son the, the power over all people, the power to rule. He had gave him dominion. He gave him jurisdiction over all people. And, and this is the same term that, that occurs in the Great Commission. When Jesus gave his, which he gave to his disciple uh, there at the, at, after his resurrection, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And Jesus told his disciples, and he's telling me and you, that go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have shown you, whatever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And you can find that great commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. But see, that power that God so sovereignly gave him over the authority of over all people. Jesus is saying, you've given me the power over all flesh. That same power was the power that Jesus was talking about there at the resurrection. In both cases, the purpose of God giving the Son the power was that he should give eternal life as to many as that would receive him or that would have him. The intent of God was, Father, that it was through the Spirit and through the Son and God that he might have eternal life who, who, for everyone who would place their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it's true Jesus died for everyone. He died that everyone's sins could be forgiven. But before we can have that forgiveness or before we, re, we can experience salvation, we have to accept that gift that he's given us. If, if somebody offered you a, a gift and told you it was yours, you could have it. But if you didn't take it, then you, you never received the benefit of that gift. And that gift is something that Jesus Christ has given us. But we have to receive it. And we have to receive it by believing in him as our Lord and Savior. And repenting of our sins and turning away from the things of this world. And turning to God and turning to his ways. And living by his word. And living to please him that others may come to know him. And that he may be glorified even as Christ glorified him. Jesus went on in verse 3 to define eternal life. He said, and this is eternal life, that they might know, they might know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life uh, is full of life. Life is, is, is a, when I think of life, I think of vitality, of of uh, just bubbling over, of having life, the fullness of existence, not just a presence, but it's a, a, a life full of meaning and life full of, 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 of vitality. This is the life that, that Jesus wants us to have with God. This is the life that God wants us to have with him. Um, it's life with God, eternal life. No beginning, no end. Uh, God life forever and forever. This is what the eternal life is. It's a fullness forevermore. Eternal life is more than just a quantity of measurement. When we talk about eternal life, we think about forever and ever. But it's more than just time. It's also a quantity of life. You see, each one of us will spend eternity somewhere. But the eternal life with Christ there in heaven with God is a quality, quantity of life as well. It's not just a, a time that will be there forever, but it's a quantity of life. It'll be a time of rejoicing. It'll be a time of, uh, that can be realized now, even in our relationship with Christ now, with our one-on-one -on -one relationship. But eternal, uh, eternal life for those who do not accept Christ will be eternal life of damnation, eternal life of separation from God, eternal life of hellfire, and it would be a, an eternal life that they will, will suffer the rest of their life. But when we talk about eternal life with God, then it's an eternal life that's full of, of everything of the best. 
what we have here and we what we see is people we think they have the best of everything then it's greater and greater than that i can't explain how much because i don't know but i know that god has told us that i has not seen or ear heard of, of the things that he has in store for us but to have eternal life is to know the true only true god and jesus christ whom god sent that's what jesus was saying here in these verses um it's, it's linked to both God the Father and God the Son. And this life comes through knowing God the Father and trusting God the Son. Uh, no one comes unto God the Father except through God the Son. You can find that in John 14, 6 and 7. No one comes to God the Father except through Jesus the Son of God. The Apostle John addressed this truth uh, of eternal life in his first epistle. And he, when he wrote his first epistle, he said, This is the record that God hath given us unto eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath not the Son, hath, he that hath the Son has life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 11 through 12. Jesus said here in these verses, And this life eternal, and this is life eternal, that they may know the one and only true God. The term know here, uh, the Greek word that's used, that this word is used for, uh, does not refer to just a head knowledge or a simple exchange of information. You see, the Bible tells us that Satan knows God and he trembles. But Satan can't be saved because Satan won't repent. And Satan has gone against God and tried to overthrow him and try to be God himself. And when we don't accept God, we place our in that ourselves in that position of placing ourselves on the throne. But to know God is more than just to know about God. To know God is to have an intimate relationship with Him. Um, it refers to the process of knowing someone through personal experience. To pers have a personal relationship. To be able to call on Him. And to be able to thank Him for those things that He's done in our life. And to be able to talk to him and ask him for guidance and help in those things that we're facing. It's a continual personal experience. It doesn't end. And it's with the Father and the Son. You see, we pray through to the Father, through the Son. So it's a continual personal relationship that we develop over time. Uh, when we come to know Christ, we, we, we start to develop that relationship with him that, that we actually come to know him. You understand what I'm saying? Not just to know about him, but we come to know him. We come to, to know of those times when he's brought us through the valley of the shadow of death, when he's led us beside the still waters, when he's restored our soul. We become to know him in that way that it's personal and it's more than just a head knowledge or, or just a time that we would sit in a Sunday school lesson and, and hear his word or sit in a preaching service and say amen and then get up and leave and forget everything that we've learned. It's not that kind of relationship. It's that not, not that kind of a knowledge. But it's, it's a heart knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus then stated in, that I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished thy work, the work which thou hast gavest me to do. He had pleased the Father. He had done the things that the Father had sent him to do. And that time had come. Jesus spoke of his words here in the past tense. You see what Jesus was saying, God, I've done what you call me to do. I've, I've come and I've lived a sinless life. I've told others about salvation, how they can have salvation by believing in me. And, and this work is completed. Uh, God the Father had given the Son work to accomplish, and he had completed that work. Uh, I guess when you were growing up, if you were like me, you had chores or things that, that you had to do. And I remember one day my mom and dad were gone, and my dad had a uh, 50, I think it was a 58 Ford Ranchero. Uh, it was 58 or 59, I can't remember. It was white, it had red interior, it was a beautiful little truck. And uh, I decided that uh, he had left the keys there, and I decided I would pull it into the backyard and I would clean it up. I, I washed it and I waxed it, I cleaned the wheels, I vacuumed out the inside, I, I cleaned the inside, I, I coated the inside with some kind of protectant, and I did, it, it looked like new money. But as I was backing it out to put it back in the spot where he had left it, I hung the door on a post there at the edge of the building. 
and it bent the driver's door all the way around to the front and all it was all i could do to, to get that door back and closed but once i closed it you couldn't open it again my heart was broken because i'd worked so hard to please my father and then i had messed it up my daddy come home he couldn't see that side of the truck he could only see the the passenger side and uh he come in the house and he was just thanking me and telling me how much he appreciated the, what I had done for him. You know, I, I, when, when, I, when I read this passage about Jesus doing the work of the Father, I thought about me doing that for my Father. But you see, I was human. I messed it up. Uh, even in my best intention, I messed up. And that's the way we are as humans. We mess it up. Uh, we back the door and hang it on a post and we crumple crumple the crinkle the door up that that it may look good from one side but the other side there's there's some faults and there's some things that that we need to to confess so i confessed to my dad dad go look at the other side and my dad didn't get mad he was appreciative of all i'd done but uh it just reminded me as i was studying this lesson of how i wanted to please my father and jesus had and and, and i messed it up but Jesus had fulfilled what he was called to do. He had pleased the Father. He had done the things that God had called him to do, and now he was ready to return home. Uh, the work and the glory was given to the Father because it, it revolved around Jesus' sacrificial death. Um, prayer is a crucial part of life of every believer. And for us to to understand this, then then we, we can listen to Jesus' prayer and know that even today he is still praying for us he ascended to heaven where he is at the the uh, right hand of the father there uh intervening for us first peter says that on our that, that he's intervening on our behalf before god the holy spirit prays for us as well the apostle paul wrote that the holy spirit who indwells every believer intercedes on our behalf he prays for us when we don't know how when we don't have the words to say and we don't know what to say he intercedes on our behalf. So we, he prays for us when we don't know what to pray. Through Jesus, we, we have access to God the Father. Through Jesus, we can pray, and, and God the Father receives a message that, that we're trying to express. Every believer has access to God the Father. Every believer has access to the creator of the universe. Uh, if that doesn't pump you up a little bit i don't know what will because the creator of the universe the god of everything the only god had we have access to him uh, prayer is, is a is a means that we cultivate the relationship and we cultivate that intimacy that we are called to have with christ and with his father god desires that we communicate god desires that we fellowship <clears throat> and, and the god desires that we come to him in prayer and that that we listen to him prayer is not always about what we say or or what talking but it's about listening as well when we pray to god and we seek an answer then we should wait on god to give us that answer and sometimes we don't do that in prayer sometimes we make our request known and then we just stop but but we need to spend that quiet time waiting god one of my desires this year is to be more intentional in my praying and in my bible reading to allow God to speak to me in a way that he's never spoken to me before, that I can grow in my relationship with him, just as he is talking about here. The question the lesson asked today, are, are you cultivating your relationship with God? Verse 5 uh, goes on, it says, And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus had glorified the the father here on earth jesus had done the things that he had the father had asked him to do soon he would be on the cross and he would cry out it is finished and and now he prayed now before that that the father would restore him to his eternal heavenly glory that he put aside to come and to walk on this earth and to die for our sins you see he longed to return home to the father you ever go on a trip uh where it's business or where it's pleasure and you get away for a few days and, and before long you're longing to be back home and be back in a routine doing the things that you've done. I won't say that Jesus longed to be back in a routine, but he longed to be back home with the Father. He longed to be back there where, where, where there was no sin. 
He longed to be back there where there was no temptation. He longed to be back there where everything was perfect. And that was the desire that he had. And that's what he had always known there in heaven. And he asked God to restore him and glorify him back to that place that he came from. You see, Jesus gave up a lot to come and to live here and to die for us. And he longed to get back to that point. John 17, we'll jump to 21 through 23, verses 21 through 23. It says that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they almost may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and that thou hast loved me. You know, we should pray to God for unity among believers. That's what Jesus is talking about here. After praying for his disciples to be present with him in that, that Passover night, Jesus' prayer shifted to all his disciples in every time and every place. Not just those of the disciples that were with him that night, but for all the disciples that would come in the future, in every corner of the world, into every place in the world. He said that they may all be as one as thou, thy Father, art in me, and I in thee. Jesus prayed that God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit would would be one in us as believers. That just as God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons, just as each one of us as disciples or as Christians are distinct persons, we're all one in Christ. We're one of the same essence. Jesus' followers would be united as well if we follow him and we follow his teachings, we'll be united the same way. The unity of God the Father and, and, and the, the Holy Spirit, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is, is described in the prologue to John's Gospel. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. It's also described by Jesus when he told his disciples that he and the Father were one, and having seen Jesus, they had seen the Father. You see, God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed from the very beginning, before the beginning. They existed there when the earth was made. The Word was, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, Jesus was there. The Holy Spirit was there. The Trinity was there in the beginning. And Jesus told him that if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. Jesus then prayed that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. To be in Christ means to abide in him. You see, to be in Christ means that we're his disciples. To be a disciple, we demonstrate the love that Christ had for us. We demonstrate that love to other people. And we demonstrate those things. We demonstrate that we're disciples by keeping his commandments. <clears throat> Put in another way, the, the, the evidence of being in Jesus and having Jesus in us is that that union of Jesus in us will bear fruit and thereby prove that we are his disciples. Today, if you profess to be a Christian, if you got baptized and you said a prayer and you were, you were baptized and, and, and you can, you're living a life that there is no fruit to prove that you're a Christian, then I question, I would, I would ask you to question, uh, in your own mind, are you one in Christ and is Christ one in you? If, if Christ is one in us and we're one in him, then we can't help but produce fruit that would be fruit that would be produced by a Christian. If, if we're in a relationship with God, the, the Father and the Son, then people will see that and people will know and see, people will believe in Jesus Christ and we'll believe the teachings that we live before them. Our words, our behaviors, our relationships, the things that we do will look completely different than the people of the world. The, 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 the world today hears a message that that God loves everyone, and God does love. He wants each one of us to come and know Him as Savior. But not everyone 
will be saved. Not everyone has salvation. And it, it, it's going to be a sad day when, when, when the end of your life comes and you haven't accepted Christ that you find out that it's too late. That's why we as teachers and preachers and, and Christians, we beg people to listen to the Word of God and to accept Him as your Savior and allow Him to change your life, to repent and turn to Him. You see, the God of unity is not a God of un uniformity. The goal of unity is so that the world may believe that God sent His Son to die for the sins of all humanity. You see, unity strengthens the witness of the church. Disunity disrupts the gospel message. And we see that a lot of times in churches that there is disunity and there's not harmony. And that's what we need to stop as a church. And so we need to stop as Christians and, and ask God to help us that we would be one with each other as God is one in, in Jesus and Jesus is one in us and us in him. Verse 22 says, And the glory which thou gavest me have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus continuing acknowledging God, that, that just as God the Father had given glory to Jesus, Jesus now had given that glory to his disciples as well. His disciples would share in Jesus' glory through taking up their crosses and, and living out their lives as Jesus' disciples. In this way, they would glorify the Father. Do we glorify the Father today? Are we taking up our cross and following Him? Are we telling others about Him? This is what God was talking about. The, and Jesus was saying when He was praying, He said, The glory which Thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Sharing in His glory meant to unify Jesus' disciples. It just meant to unify the church. It's meant to unify the Christians. It's meant to unify the believers, that they may be one just as the Father and, and God, the Son of one. The unity of the Bible, the body of Christ, the church, is patterned after the unity of the Trinity. Uh, that, that, that there's the Trinity, that there's three persons, but there is one essence. They're of the same mind, of the same purpose, to accomplish the same task. And the church is made up of many members, many different people with different talents. And God has organized the church, and, and he's organized us at Whitefield in this way that we can bring our different talents, that we can bring our different thoughts, that, but that we all have one purpose, and that is to glorify God and to bring others to Christ. You see, the body of Christ has that overriding mission to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to the world, to a lost world, to a dying world, and to make disciples of those who will come to faith in Christ. The Bible tells us that throughout, but in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you can find the verses that support that especially. Verse 23 says, I and them and thou and me, and they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The focus of this verse is also in unity. Uh, Jesus stated that he is in his disciples and the Father is in him so that the disciples may be made perfect in one, so that they may be perfect. Jesus' prayer was his disciples would share that unity of one purpose, and that is living for the Father, that others may come to know him. He wanted us to have that deep love relationship that he had with his Father. He wants us to have that with him and his Father and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, he wants us to have that relationship that's between him and the Father. He wants us to be because we are his children, we should have that same relationship. The world, he wants the world to believe that, that God sent his son into this world to die for them. And he does that through our unity and the sharing of the gospel. Unity in Christ is a, is a powerful witness to, to watch. Uh, the source of unity for Christians is love, or should be. It should be our source of unity. Um, after washing, Jesus had washed the disciples' feet. He gave him a new commandment. And you can find that in 1 John. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have also loved you. By this shall all men know 
that you are my disciples if you love one another. People, we need to be unified as Christians today that we love each other and that we love the world. But we love each other and we love the world enough to be honest and to tell them about the, the misleadings that are being taught today. To tell them uh, that it's only one way to, G to God and that's through the Son, through Jesus Christ. The second part of the person of the Christian unity is that that the world would know that Jesus' disciples are loved by God, God the Father, and He loves us with the same love that He had for His Son Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed all believers would be as one body, uh, that body united through the Holy Spirit, under the head of Christ Himself. The more the more we as the church we fight among ourselves, and the more. Uh, we, we do these things that are wrong, then we hinder the growth of, the, of Christ's body here on earth. We need to pray for unity with Jesus and with our fellow believers. And then, by God's grace and His strength, we need to, to live out this reality of unity with each other. If, if, if unity is so important, what are these? friction and the factions and the, the disunity arise in church. Paul attributed uh, disunity as works of the flesh. The works of the flesh, they quench the spirit. It grieves the spirit. The spirits grieve through our bitterness and our anger and, and, our, and our wrath and through slothing and slander. Believers can uh, oppose um, this unity in the body of Christ, and 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 can be even in can can appear to be in unity, but actually be in disunity. God wants us to be united together as 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 one, following Him. John seventeen verses twenty four through twenty six. Jesus said, "Father, I will. Father, I want to." Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known thee, that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. And the love wherein thou hast loved me, may I may be in them and I in them. You see, we, we need to pray for God's love to be known and to be experienced by everyone. We need to pray that we as believers would have that relationship and we would know that love that, that Jesus Christ is talking about here. You see, Jesus continued his prayer. He said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. <coughs> Jesus' desire here is that his disciples would be with him. And he's not just talking about the 12 disciples. He's not just talking about those who walk with him on this earth. But Jesus' prayer is for us to be with him. He says, Whom thou hast given me, be here where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Jesus was speaking of those disciples who had already been with him, that he prayed that they would come back and see his glory. But he was also speaking of us, his disciples, that, that we've never actually seen him in person and, and been with him as the disciples was. Despite all that Jesus was about to face going to the cross, his thoughts and desire was about wanting to be with, with those people who loved him and whom he loved. What a gift that we have through Jesus Christ, through the grace of the love of God, the Father, through Jesus. Jesus said, Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. It points to that perfect relationship that Jesus and God had uh, even before the foundation of the world. Similar language was used by Paul, Peter, in describing how God foreknew and and plan Christ's redeeming death before the foundation of the world. God's love for us is seen in, in this, that God chose, has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. 
In his love, God prepared the entire plan of redemption in Christ before time ever began. Do you see this? The creator of the universe, before he created it, God knows everything. You see, he's not, he's not on a timeline. He, he can see from beginning to end. And he knew before he even created us that we would sin against him. And he provided for us to have a savior that would come and redeem. He would pay for the price for our sins that we could have eternal life even before he created the world. He had this plan because he knows all. In verse 25, it says, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Jesus addressed the Father again as righteous. Jesus addressed the Father as righteous. Righteous. You see, righteous, there's only one person that's right. That's God the Father. Of course, the Holy Spirit and God the Son. But the righteousness of God is the standard, is the measuring stick for us to measure ourselves against, to see where we're falling short, that we could work harder to become more like Christ. You see, only Jesus lived a perfect life, and only Jesus measured up to that standard. But one day, that perfect standard of God is by which we will all be judged. Because he did what he did, he, he, Jesus was an acceptable, atoning sacrifice for all men. Because he did what he did, living a perfect life and rejecting Satan and turning down temptation, he, because he did all these things, he was the perfect payment for our sin. And he accomplished that for our salvation. After Jesus' resurrection, his disciples would be going out into the world to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel of salvation to a world that would be hostile towards them. And, and Jesus knew that. But, but the, Jesus sent the followers, and God sent his followers, and he, he, they knew that they were being sent by God. And disciples recognized that just as Jesus was on a mission directly ordered by God, they were also on a mission to, be, to share the gospel just as, as uh, God had told Jesus his mission. Verse 26, in this final verse, it says, I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it with the love therein that, that thou hast loved me. May I be in them, and I in, I in them. May be in them, and I in them. Jesus had made, made God known to his disciples. The Jews had adopted a, uh, a remote and highly transcendent view of God. Uh, and likewise, they had been avoiding the name of God. They, they didn't like to to talk about God for they were in fear of taking his name in vain but Jesus reintroduced the necessity of having that divine person of God in our life uh, that encounter of God that intimacy with Jesus God, Jesus reintroduced that to disciples not as a high powerful God that we can't approach but someone who would, we could come to and that he would die for us and that he would send his son to die for us and that we could turn to him and we could have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him now through his disciples jesus would continue to be to make known god's love for the world you know you can't read through this verse without thinking always throughout scripture that god has sought to have a relationship with his people romans 3 9 it says god seeks us when we don't naturally seek him he's seeking us the phrase i and them echoes the theme of god's covenant after giving the law to Israelite uh, through Moses at Sinai, God resided in, in the, with the Israelites in the tabernacle. And when the Israelites settled in the promised land and became a nation, God resided among them there in the temple. Now through every uh, uh, accomplished atoning work of Jesus Christ, God resides in every believer through the indwelling Holy Spirit. You see, the same God that dwelled with the, the Israelites the same God that dwelled there in the temple, the same God that dwelled with them in the promised land, dwells with us through his Holy Spirit. Prayer and reading of his word draws us closer to Jesus, and it draws us our hearts closer to an alignment with his, that we have that desire in our hearts to do what Jesus has called us to do and to do the things that the Father sent the Son to do, to tell others about him. We must pray for unity with God, and we must pray for unity among other believers. 
And we must pray for God's love to be known and to experience by those around us through Jesus Christ. As popular as Facebook and Snapchat and texting and all those things are, they can never replace that, that ultimate intimate relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. They can't, uh, it, our prayers must be intimate. It's not a short, quick, short, without ever taking time. We have to have an intimate conversation with God and we spend daily time with him. We spend time in prayer, we spend time in his word, and he then rewards us with a life of closeness to him that is so incredible that you can't describe it. If you're not having that kind of relationship with Christ today, I pray that you would. I pray that if you have accepted Christ as your savior, that you would, and you've fallen away, that you would get into his word and that you would study and that you would pray and you would develop and, and let him fill you with his desire let him fill your heart with the heart of love that he has for us and i pray today that if you're not a christian if you have not accepted christ as your savior that the day would be the day of salvation you see we're not, not promised our next breath and, and i don't say that to scare anyone in any way i say that as a reality i say that as reality with this with this virus and with this many deaths as we're seeing today it burdens my heart and my soul that, that there may be people dying without Christ and, and I can't go visit them because of the visitation rules and, and the different things that, are, that we're restricted by today. But I can pray for them and you can pray for me and I can pray for you. And that's what we want to do is we want to pray and we want to develop that relationship that, that God had with the Father and that God wants to have with us. I pray that you have a blessed day. I pray that you have a great week. And I hope to see you next Sunday, February the 14th, Valentine's Day, as we'll dive deep into God's Word again. Thank you so much, and God bless you, and I love you. And if there's something that we can ever do for you here at Whitefield Baptist Church, please let us know. Uh, please let us know. We have a care line, uh, and, and you can call that at any time, any time, day or night. You can call on us, and we'll be there for you. God bless you. Thank you again, and hope you have a great week. I got the